Welcome to episode 86 of the Luke Messia Show. I am joined by two attorneys who are some of the, uh, I don't know, most ardent, articulate, brilliant legal minds that conservatives in Texas have to offer us, which could be uh, a bad bad news for conservatives, or it could be a blessing. We're going to find that out today. Um, Matt Rinaldi and Warren Norid, uh, I asked them to come on and talk to us about some of the various different actions that Governor Abbott's taking and uh, and just how they relate from a legal perspective. And then, Warren, we're also going to get into some of the different lawsuits that the governor is experiencing currently, and you can kind of update our listeners on that. So, Matt, um, I know that you recently had some commentary that you put out regarding two proposals that were put out, one by the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, and one by our governor here in Texas, Greg Abbott, both to address uh, violent riots. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's a clear distinction within some of the policy proposals and some overlap. Why don't you kind of give people an update on on what those are? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to go over Governor Abbott's first, but I don't want to imply that that came first. Governor Abbott, like he has been on reopening, like he has been on everything else, is following DeSantis, mm. uh, decidedly uh, making decisions afterwards. So DeSantis came out with uh, a proposal to combat rioting. And then about a week later, Governor Abbott came out with his proposal, which included portions of DeSantis's proposal, but left out the good stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like Governor Abbott, for example, had six points. One, uh, so the following uh, four acts would be felonies. Uh, causing injury or destroying property in a riot, striking a law enforcement officer during a riot, uh, using lasers to target officers, blocking hospital entrances and exits, um, using fireworks at riots would be a crime, uh, and aiding and abetting riots would be a felony and also uh, would be subject to civil actions by the attorney general. Now, that misunderstands really the problem, which is that Democrat DAs are not enforcing the current laws we have against things like arson and assault, um, and letting these rioters free, even the ones that are arrested are let free without bail. Um, So none of this changes that. The first five and part of the sixth point that I just mentioned, they're all enforceable by those same DAs. So if they're not enforcing the law now, they're not going to enforce this. Um, Lastly, the the number six, uh, the part enforceable by the attorney general, yes, that will have some effect, but it frankly isn't enough. Now, to go over what DeSantis did, um, Ron DeSantis uh, included that, included some of the defunding the Mm -hmm. the police proposals to to disincentivize cities to defund the police, but also included three very important things, one of which was victim compensation. It waives sovereign immunity to allow the victim of a crime related to a riot to sue local government for damages where the local government's grossly negligent in protecting persons and property. Now that goes right to the heart of the DAs and cities that are, are electing those mm-hmm. DAs, um, you know, financially. And, and that, that will actually have a real world effect. Second thing um, is related to obstructing roadways. He includes a third degree felony to obstruct traffic during a riot, very notably absent from uh, Abbott's proposal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, holds that drivers are not liable for injury or death caused if fleeing for safety from a mob. I mean, I think that's important, right? Because these DAs aren't only protecting the riders, they're attacking the, the individuals who are protecting themselves. Mm-hmm. We saw that with the, the, the couple from St. Louis. Um, and then the, the last one uh, that I wanted to point out was, um, what was the third one? I just talking to Warren about it. Um, prohibition on obstructing uh, roadways, victim compensation, um, and government employment and benefits, which is very oh, yeah. important. Um, yep. Terminates state benefits and makes anyone ineligible for employment by state or local government if you're convicted of participating in a riot. Um, very important. We saw uh, many public school teachers were arrested in Portland and put right back on the streets. Mm. Uh, you shouldn't be working for the government if you're participating in a riot. And Abbott left these off. The reason why he left them off, I believe, and I suspect, is because they were the points that Democrats objected to very vocally. Because mm. they're the points that actually make a difference. Yep. Um, 
and he left him out. And that's why I think his proposal doesn't, won't really have much real world effect. So Ron DeSantis comes out with this set of proposals that are going to address the riots. And then following that, Abbott comes out with his own set of proposals, removing these three parts. One that says, if you're a public employee and you're participating in a riot, you're going to lose your pension, right? You, you cannot go do that. Which, by the way, you would not have public employees going and being violent rioters if they knew that I'm potentially got my entire retirement at stake. Um, mm. And then saying, hey, you can't obstruct roadways uh, and and people can flee a violent riot and, and be immune from prosecution. Mm-hmm. And then also empowering you, the citizen, if you are in a violent riot and you are there as a result of the fact that all of the local officials, which is what's happening in these urban centers that are run solely by Democrats, if they have all created an environment where they are encouraging this type of behavior to happen, then you're going to at least have some legal standing to go sue them and say, hey, I was a victim of a crime that you basically allowed to happen, which that to me also points to the problems with the proposals that Abbott and even DeSantis Mm -hmm. and some of those had where they say, hey, we're going to further empower local Democrats to, if they want to, go after these violent rioters. They don't need further empowerment, as you've pointed out, because they're not currently enforcing the laws that are on the book. So Warren, what, what do you think? Well, I, I, I get asked all the time because of the lawsuits, you know, what can the governor do yep. that would not trip my wire uh, and accusations of unconstitutionality? Because I tend to believe that a lot of what he's doing is yep. wrong. Uh, but the waiver of sovereignty, that's, that is something that he can do, right? That, mm-hmm. That's not taking away the rights of anybody. You know, and so I, I love that idea because mm-hmm. that's something he can do. Uh, I, I like the idea of if you're, and because we think about this all the time, you're, you're going through downtown and somebody decides we're going to have a riot and you're in this zombie apocalypse situation where what do you, are you going to let the miscreants destroy your car? Are you going to drive through them and possibly damage one? Uh, what are you going to do? These are real problems that mm-hmm. people really have. And I, so I love the idea of saying we're going to take a legal position as a state that you have the right to be in your car and leave without being damaged. And if you hurt somebody, that's on them. They shouldn't be in front of you. Um, so I love that. I don't love so much the idea of making crimes. We have a Texas Constitution, right? Who gets to make crimes under our Texas Constitution? Texas legislature. Hmm. So I don't like it when the when that happens. Well, right now, so the governor's proposal right now is a legislative proposal, and so is DeSantis. Both of them are out of session right now. So I think the the what he is proposing is that the legislature makes those crimes. But I do agree with you. He has the power to, I think, under Section 418.016 of the governor uh, of the government code, uh, has the ability to suspend certain laws and rules in a state of emergency. And he's done it for plumbers right. because of Hurricane Harvey that occurred two it, years this, before. Right. So I'm pretty sure he can but suspend I don't like that governmental. Either. I know. I don't like that either. <laughs> but if he's going to do that, I'm pretty sure he can suspend governmental immunity if he can confine me to my house and restrict my travel. Right. Um, because c- certainly the riots are a threat to public health and safety. And certainly suspending governmental immunity for people who don't prosecute rioters is promoting public health and safety. I think he could do that now. Or, or, or even or even saying I'm I'm not defining a crime but I'm defining a defense. Yeah. And so if you're fleeing bad guys and you think that riders would get a clue. Mm-hmm. For example, don't don't run after guys that have AR15s. Mm. That's probably not going to work out well for you. But, you know, the person that that is fleeing with their car just trying to get out of there and you're faced with really running somebody over mm. or potentially hurting them or just losing your car to to vandalism uh, and destruction, I think you have to say, no, we're not going to reward that. And I think that the government taking a position that that's going to be a defense and, and you and you're going to allow people to do that. Uh, I think that's a, absolutely valid. And I and I even smacking around the Disaster Act of 1975, uh, deciding that you can uh, define a crime is very different. From, or deciding that somebody can't work is different from allowing people more freedom to do the thing that they didn't do in mm. order to combat that. And so mm. uh, I love the idea of uh, if, if you're going to be involved in riotous behavior, um, then you don't get to work for the state. You don't, you don't get to get the benefits from that. You cannot at one point say, I want anarchy, and then 
and then benefit from the fact that there's not anarchy because there mm. is a state that's paying you something. Mm. Yeah. You got to play the ball both ways. Uh, so I, I think that any, any of this development is good, but I really think the biggest problem is that if you tell people they have to go back to work, they'll have less time to riot. Mm. And if you tell people they mm-hmm. can't work, then you're asking them to riot. It's almost a request. Please riot. I'm not letting you have money. I'm not letting you earn money. I'm creating a situation where you have time on your hands and you have nothing better to do than to go see what the riot's up about. Um, we, we were talking about this before the, the, the uh, riots and the disaster of Mr. Floyd. Um, it, it, you are going to have issues when you say people can't work. And, and even though we're mostly open now, we have a whole slice, you know, the bar fight, you know, what I call the bar fight, all those lawsuits. You have the TABC saying you can't work. It's unconstitutional. Mm. I, you can't earn a living no matter what you do from the top down. So um, if you want to not have riotous behavior, you have to allow people to work. That's step one. And we're missing still step one. So, yeah. Well, so, I mean, I think you bring up an important point because I don't think you need a new disaster declaration tied to rioting to actually suspend those particular rules because um, there's no doubt that a lot of the civil unrest we're seeing is tied to those shutdown orders. I mean, I think you it's saw it. I, I think I yeah. tweeted in, in the beginning of April when uh, Governor Abbott first issued his order. I mean, do you want riots? Because this is how you get riots. Yeah. And we got riots. Right. Um, very foreseeable. Um, but so I don't think you need a new disaster declaration. You're preventing something that's coming of, right. about because of the pandemic. So the governor can do this tomorrow. The governor can actually make a difference on rioting tomorrow if he wants to, instead of a legislative proposal that really isn't going to do anything uh, in the future. Not for months and months. Yeah. No. So it's, poli- I mean, it's political as long as he sticks to this. Um, if he wants to make a difference tomorrow, he could with the stroke of a pen. Doesn't seem to want to do it right now. And he could with the stroke of a pen say... Just to just to hone it in with a stroke of a pen, you're saying he could he could one provide protections for anybody who's trying to flee a riot, right? Right. So he could say, "Look, I'm currently rolling out these proposals due to the mm-hmm. fact that there are riots, and so if a Texan is caught in a riot, I want to make sure that they are protected from prosecution if they're in a situation where they have to flee and they are being blockaded and kept." From fleeing, mm-hmm. if somebody's attacking your car, I don't think anybody's fleeing because they're worried about their car. I think they're worried about people getting in the car. Right. I mean, that's just There's the no truth that, of right. what happens there. So, yeah. um, and then the other one being the other that two. you could send a message to say, if you are a public employee and you in any way involve yourself with these, you are not going to be eligible to receive your pension. Well, is that a let is it, or does he have to wait for the legislature to? He do can that? absolutely make it a condition of employment. I mean, he can make a policy tomorrow. Yes. That, uh, no. No public employee uh, can be convicted of rioting and still have their job. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The it, pension might actually need a legislative. Yeah, that, you, you probably that's a can't little iffy. That and certainly, the waiver of sovereign immunity under four eighteen is is something that he yes, can do tomorrow yeah. So well. he could right now say, I, I, "Look, I, I just want to make that. it clear, yeah. Yeah. all local officials, if most, you're going to aid and abed within these rights, if you're going to create this type of scenario, then." People can sue the crud out of you. And that's the most effective. And by the way, if you do incentivize the uh, local DAs to actually enforce these laws, we saw Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right? How long did those riots happen? Not very long because they were setting bail at a million dollars for anyone who was arrested for rioting. <laughs> um, if you're a celebrity and you want to help these people out, we are happy to take your money. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> and, and you even saw on bullhorns, they were warning the people, do not destroy property because they're setting a million dollars bail. So they're very, they're very aware of the enforcement. And once you start enforcing this, these riots will disappear. So Warren, uh, separate from the rioting, you're involved in a number of legal actions against the governor. Right. Um, and then probably familiar with others that you might not be directly involved with. Do you want to kind of give us just a general update on the lay of the land? Where are we legally speaking when it comes to legal actions that are really challenging the governor's unilateral authority that he has acted as though he has. Sure. Um, back in back in April, right at the time that the Shelley Luther case came about, Shelley mm-hmm. was actually part of a, a team of about 12 or so plaintiffs. And we tried to go up fast, right, the writ of mandamus to the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. The Supreme Court wrote this wonderful concurring denial. It was, it was beautiful. You know, it was a work of art. Four of them said, ah, we... We'd like to see you another day, but not today. You've got to work up, work your way up. So, okay, fine. And about that time, Shelley's uh, Shelley Luther had her 
single there. She was the only one of the plaintiffs that said, no, I've got to open. And so, so that started. Uh, And we still have counterclaims. So we put Mm -hmm. counterclaims against the governor in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. um, And that the governor and the state were let off last week by Judge Moyer. And so we're considering um, the the opportunity. That that judge is in Dallas County. Yeah. And he has an he has an excellent um, opposing candidate in an upcoming election. I'm just going to say that, you know, uh, but uh, but he so he was he let out that the governor and the state. I think the state may be okay. I'm not sure. But uh, but I think that our case against the governor is still valid. So we may, may appeal that, but we have that. That's a mundane civil court case between mm-hmm. the city of Dallas and Shelly Luther in her salon. Mm-hmm. Right. And so people sometimes think about a criminal action, but it's, it's just a lawsuit. They say she was unhealthy and mm-hmm. we say, no, she wasn't healthy. Mm-hmm. And that's TC Broadnax, the city manager making up rules. The unelected city manager can just make up rules ex cathedra and they are enforceable law. Mm. I got a real problem with that. Um, but the other interesting things, the big one that we filed a couple, uh, probably a month ago uh, now is the the uh, contract tracing case, mm-hmm. $295 million uh, on a non-public, mm-hmm. badly bid um, process. We talked to a number of the players that actually bid on that. We have a declaration from one of the actual people that were part of that that said, look, this is not the normal way that mm-hmm. we normally see. Normally there's some give and take. People will say, maybe we have some, a better way of doing this mm-hmm. than throwing people at it. Uh, and so we, we filed that and that's, I think we got an injunction hearing in the middle of October on that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Have we spent any of that money yet? We have spent money on that. Mm-hmm. We absolutely have. Absolutely. So, um, but nobody knows how much at this point. I don't think anybody knows how much. Yeah. So it, it's and so the, fast. And, we and can't the, reach. You know, and the, to know the contract, real world effect to be, Quite honest, I mean, no. Well, that's one of the criticisms is that, is that we're spending money and we're not really seeing what's going on. So, so yeah. uh, it's interesting to see where contact tracing is in like full enforcement. You have, uh, I was talking to a friend yesterday who's in DC, and um, in order for him to, when, when he's going to church, his church is taking a list of all attendees and sending that to City Hall. Wow. Right. And so that's the reason he's not going to church. They're doing like 25%, I think, capacity is what the churches are there. But I mean, he told his pastor, he said, I, I love and respect you for various reasons, but I'm sorry, I cannot come to your church right now. If you're literally going to take my name and send it to the government to let them know I'm there, I can go to a restaurant without doing that, but I can't go to church. And so it's interesting where you see that kind of that full level effect. What I thought was weird with the contact tracing to, um, was that it's over a, a two-year period of time. I mean, it wasn't like, right. hey, we need you to come in and just start helping us now. It was like, we want to spend $300 million over several years. Well, this is the funny thing. is We have a constitutional provision that says the contracts are not supposed to be more than two years. And it's more than two years. Now, it's not a lot longer than two years, but yeah. it's more than two years. So we're just... We're just ignoring these standard rules. Yes. You know, is this, is there some reason why we can't at least publicly post the bid spec and let people really mm-hmm. pr- put out proposals and have the back and forth that you expect to have when, when you're doing a major proposal like that? No, we don't need any of that. We're just going to give it to my soon to be good friend, MTX, and they can, they can have it all. So they're part of the, they're part of the suit. And, and, and to that same extent, you go, why are you spending $300 million to follow me around 20 months from now? Like, what is it that you're planning <laughs> yeah. on doing in 20 months? Well, some I mean, of it's in the just, play now. Us, you have, I mean, what, what is it estimated? We're catching one-tenth of the cases and we have 150,000 positives in Texas, so yeah. 1.5 million. Okay, you, p- picture contact tracing on the flu. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, have you left your house? You've been exposed. Okay, yeah, now you stay home. There you go. Now you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. There you go. That's yeah. pretty much the same thing. Give me a hundred million dollars. Yeah, well, it's, we, I think a, a lot of it ends up being, you know, post 9-11, we had what we called security theater, right? Where people mm-hmm. were just running mm-hmm. around, people in BDUs uh, and off in, in soldiers' uniforms with, that, with unloaded weapons to make people feel good. And now I think we have the mask mandate, which is very similar. It's virus theater. Mm-hmm. You know, we have, the CDC has posted uh, a, uh, report that showed that outside healthcare environments, the masks are not valuable, not valuable, not valuable. I mean, that's, then that was based on the, the, uh, H1N1, uh, from a couple of years ago. And so, uh, or the, the flu. 
And so we know that these things really don't have a substantial impact. Okay, so I'm wearing my mask. I open the same nasty door of the restaurant that everybody else has touched. I pull out the chair, the same nasty chair everybody else has touched. On the way out, none of us wear our masks because what are they going to do? Kick us out anyway? Mm -hmm. So we have, but but you get the mask shaming. I just came from Colorado where you can get cited in Breckeridge for not yeah. wearing your mask, right? Yeah. And so do masks have any impact? Oh, sure. I'm sure they have some 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 impact, but we we are doing things that have this theater impact of we. Is it outweighed by other things? Right, like people it, people get up to your face now because they think it's okay because right, have a mask you know, and on. so and then they've got yeah. the, they've yeah. got it below their nose. I'm not ever. I mean, Keep literally touching it and, every day. Yeah. I have a thirty minute to an hour long consultation with somebody who's got uh, a serious problem. You know, all these kids and they're going to school, and somebody says, "Well, my kid has an actual problem with wearing the mask." Uh, and then the school says, tough, we're going to make you go to the nursing office every mm -hmm. single time you need to take the mask down as a policy. Of course, you have a number, all the kids are wearing it below their nose and not wearing it right anyway, but we can't yeah. allow somebody to openly say, I have an issue, therefore I don't want to wear it or I want to be able to pull it down. And I'm in my, my conversation with a local superintendent this weekend was, Look, I'm not asking for the child to be able to not wear it or rebelliously say anything. She can wear it. She gets to her non-transitory position in the school where she could take it down and breathe. It's, no, we're gonna. She's. I cannot agree to that. So I, I said, so she could just do it as long as the teacher doesn't say anything. Like all the other kids, mm -hmm. is okay. Yeah, I, the policy is she's got to wear the mask all the time, and if she wants to take it down, she's got to go to the nursing office. It's a real problem. So you also are involved in a lawsuit um, on behalf of several bars. Is that correct? Yeah. The, and um, now there's been a number of lawsuits. There are at least four lawsuits on right bars, and we are mm -hmm. one of them. Um, and one of them, like you know, Jared has his down at Jared Woodfield down in Houston, mm -hmm. and he has these. Ten he has this tendency to have these huge. This is all un un unconstitutional lawsuits, which mm -hmm. which I agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, ours is more nuanced in that it includes more of a, an as applied theory. You know, you've got um, the rail in Fort Worth, Chris Pallone, uh, He is like a modern day Sam Adams, and he is great. And so. If there was tea in a harbor, man, he would already be in the harbor if it's up to Chris. And so they have a, the problem is that the, the, the regulators have decided to go with a plus 51%. Mm -hmm. and of course, a bar is defined at 60 plus. Interesting. But we're going to I 51. actually thought it was 51. So, okay. No, yeah, it's 51. So, so bar is 60. It's bar is 60. So, but why are they using 51? Well, because a regulator can go by and say, is the no gun sign in there? There it is. Okay. That means it's over 51. So they can go in and they and so they have an easier time. It's an easier for, identifying a, you, right? It's a bright line regulation rule, so mm -hmm. it's just easier for the regulators, and that would be uh, not insane, except that it, it it is if you if it's enforced in a uh, in a way that that doesn't take into account what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm real big on the right to work. Mm -hmm. If you want to have people not rebelling and not rioting, you need to have them be able to work mm -hmm. so they can earn money. Um, the way we do it right now is that if you have a 50 plus 51%, then you cannot be open for any reason, mm -hmm. for no reason. You can't have a church picnic with no alcohol there. You can't have a band practice. You can't have a charitable event, bingo thing. You can't do anything. You have to remain closed or the TABC will come by and they'll cite you and they'll say, well, we'll suspend your, your suspension if you'll sign this document that says all of the governor's executive orders are law and I agree with that and I'm going to follow it from now on. And then we can play games. You can get a food truck. Mm. And so you can start selling a pretzel for $5 and you get a free beer. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So it's turned into, it, it, we're, we are almost a prohibition level yep. uh, era of, of yep. uh, kind of playing games with this. And so, th and this is what I want people to understand. The way the system works now, let's say I've got a room this size, it's a bar. And if it's all, if it's all it is, it's a bar, it's, it's plus 51% mm -hmm. and it's illegal to operate for any reason. I can't have a non-alcoholic event at all in my bar. I have to just totally lose money. The governor's order doesn't say I don't have to pay my lease. The governor's order doesn't, doesn't say that all of my bills get to stop too. Yep. It just says I can't make any money yep. or even have anything that doesn't make money. But if I take the same room doing the same thing and I put it inside a Chili's, so it's surrounded by a restaurant. But what's going on in my bar is exactly the same. Same thing. Well, now it's okay. So what was 
sick, because that's what they're using for is the health and safety code that's to right. come after them. They're not saying that we've got a new regulation. They're just saying, we've defined you as operating while sick and held healthy. Same thing. Suddenly that's okay. So if you surround the same bar with a restaurant, now it's okay to have. If they said, if the governor said bar areas are off limits, mm -hmm. so everybody has to close their bar, at least that would be consistent. Consistent. But this is unequal, unequal treatment to say, put a pretend restaurant around your bar by putting a food truck out there. Mm -hmm. Or like that's safe or more sanitary. Uh, or have any restaurant by your bar, and that's okay. Or you but get like the, the New York restaurants where they sell food, and it's like for $5, one peanut. Yep. It's yeah. a peanut. <laughs> and a beer. A peanut and a beer. <laughs> and you get a beer. Yes. And so we're, yeah. that's I like when it was games. like, uh, the guy says, but you, he was like, a couple stale pretzels and then right underneath it was like, no, really they're not very good. You know? like, and the bar owner was just like, okay, here you go. Here's your gin and tonic. You know, he I mean, just yeah. uh, tried to figure out how to make it. Three weeks I was at a, at a bar and it was, it was truly prohibition. He was not supposed to be open. Mm -hmm. He had the lights were off. We could all see from the lights coming in. This is a downtown area uh, nearby. And, and we were all in there and the doors were closed. I happened to know the guy that was owner and we were, we were all in there drinking and paying with our credit card for a, for our booze mm -hmm. that was totally illegal. And yeah. I'll, I'll just say it right out here. I don't mind. You know, that's, you got what is wrong with this? Didn't it's we learn strange. this between the, was it 17th and 21st, 18th to 21st amendments to the constitution? We learned that that was not a good way to go, but. So, so, so let's also point to under the bar prohibition, Texas wineries are completely closed and, mm -hmm. and, and breweries as well and distilleries. But, uh, you know, interesting thing in Greg Abbott's Texas wineries are completely closed. But in Gavin Newsom's California, I can fly out there and go to a winery right now. They oh, I like the appointments. They're open. When we first started this thing, yeah. the people who came to us first were the vape shops. Now, vape shops. Mm are actually essential under the definition because they are consumer electronics. Looks weird, but that's what they are, right? <laughs> uh, but but they really aren't of the ilk that the county judges like. Mm -hmm. So they didn't make the cut and all the county judges and cities were trying to close them all down. So we started to file those lawsuits and we filed one in San Antonio and, mm -hmm. and we all came to an agreement uh, when that finally got worked out. Uh, but the liquor stores, Oh yeah, liquor stores are essential. I said, and I keep going, why are liquor stores essential? Not that I want liquor stores to be closed, but why are liquor stores essential? Yeah. Well, the alcoholics will go into withdrawal. And I go, okay, I've known alcoholics. They're not going to withdrawal. They will go buy this cheap beer and the wine at the grocery stores. They are not going to go into withdrawal because they can't get Jack. Jack Daniels, right? You know, that's just not going to happen. But is, but more importantly, is that a finding anywhere in any, whereas in any of these executive orders? No. no. But county judges, they drink wine and they drink hard liquor. They don't do vapes. So vaping was not illegal and, not, and, and non-essential and had to be closed. Well, every liquor store gets to remain open. Yeah. So it's... Just and one, and one of the points that I think <laughs> has been made time and time again, and every single time the governor has one of these rollouts of, you know, opening things back up is that none of the regulatory decisions are being made with any type of data that backs no. them up with right. any type. And there's not even an explanation they're as not, to they're why. They're not even pretending. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're done. Because it's like they know that the explanation would make no sense. So instead it's like, hey, we've decided these people should still be close. Well, why? Well, yeah. And, and I remember... You probably remember the TV interview that Abbott did when they he was asked about bars and he was talking about how well they go in there and they start drinking and then they get closer to each other and blah and you're going that's everyone every every place they go I mean you know and and also to the understanding that you're explaining what what you've witnessed at one bar one time that no, no, another it's, bar it's, owner couldn't just say here's how we're going to conduct business and that people couldn't go in there and say hey during covid times we're going to be a little more careful it, it was the father ran at the dinner table you know yeah, like yeah. i'll tell you what's really causing all this covid all around <laughs> it's those kids at the bars yep. that's what we heard out of abbott i mean yep. absolutely no data nothing to support it maybe the last time he went to a bar it was like the 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 uh, start <laughs> club in, in 1970s or 80s whenever that was you know if they get this idea bar look like writhing young people barely dressed you know uh, doing strange things on the dance floor instead of cheers 
mm-hmm. you know, yeah. which is what most bars are. You know, although I think if you look at the contact tracing data, I think what did they do? Tie three cases to restaurants mm. in the state of Texas. Yet, you know, we scale back seventy-five to fifty percent capacity, which also doesn't mean anything because you have six-foot rules. So the seventy-five and the fifty mm. are basically a fifty percent capacity anyway. I I feel like Warren, a lot of the things you've even talked about today, I was thinking through again reiterate the reason that we think government should be really small mm. and and my point being that okay a bar is 60 percent alcohol right but right. we're just gonna say 51 percent for the sake so really you could be a restaurant even legally in the state of texas but we're gonna treat you like a bar and shut you down now yes. so there are restaurants who are not bars even according to the state that are being treated like a bar because it's easier for the bar to distinguish them is that correct um, as long as it's a restaurant or that if it has a restaurant permit, yes. which is a secondary permit for yes. the bars, then they're, they're okay. Even if they have a 51%. Yes. If, if, if they have, if they have the secondary, but they have to have that, they have to second. And I think that it probably, I tell you, it, it depends really on the regulator nearby. There yeah. are TBC guys that are, uh, we had one in Fort Worth. Well, yeah, and they had a, a, a metaphorical SWAT team mm-hmm. of five co- sets of cops, and for TABC people, because Pallone mm-hmm. is a leader of the resistance, mm-hmm. right? There was a Saturday if, if about a month ago where mm-hmm. everybody was encouraged to open up for one day, not selling alcohol. Oh, mm-hmm. the Lord forbid they can't sell alcohol, but they were having an event. They're just being open. And that was the funny thing about Pallone. He had a, uh, he had a non-alcoholic concert <clears throat> and they had tape marked everybody's six foot distance. They were doing everything right that every restaurant could possibly do. And, uh, and they told it, they told everybody they're going to do this. And like 15 minutes before they're going to start the show, TAB comes in and says, we're going to shut you down. You got an hour to get everybody out. And, so, and, and look around and you say, okay, you are, you are deciding that because we're plus 51% right here, that we should not be able to do this event Mm-hmm. but go down the street to the Chili's and I pick on Chili's all the time because we all yep. know, right? And it's, and it's a, a full bar, yep. normal stuff. And, and it, to that, that is this is actually also even similar, uh, like Steve Toth talked about in his recent letter to the governor, how you're, you're raising their restaurants capacity from 50 to 75%, but you're not changing the regulations on exactly where the tables need to be, yeah. which means that the restaurants can't even open at 75%. So, so it's not really And 75%. oh, by the way, the... The restaurants are still not making money at fifty or sixty or seventy five percent. They need to be allowed to actually. It's, it's, this is you the know, problem enact. that that bureaucrats at, uh, have. You know, is Greg Abbott giving up his salary? Nope. Our president does at least because, but, but Greg Abbott calls himself uh, uh, essential, and he's not paying the price. No. He's happy to let ordinary mundane people pay mm-hmm. the price mm-hmm. for his, if, and he doesn't have to do this, right? Yep. You know, we wonder about what, what would have been a better solution. Uh, a better solution would be to say, okay, we're going to waive some of these things. We're going to say, look, if you go into a bar, every commercial entity has to put a sign on the front door that says, mm-hmm. this is how we're dealing with this. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and if you want to go in, then you get to go in. If you don't, you don't have to go in. And, and, all these lawsuits that we filed, none of them were filed a day into this or two days into mm-hmm. this, right? Or a month into this. If you look at the policy of the non-essential essential dichotomy and, and that, that whole paradigm, that's a weekend or week-long policy. Mm. That's not a sustainable policy. You, you, and people can say, in fact, I've had a lot of people say, a lot of young women say, you know, if the governor was a female, I bet the salons would have never been closed like that because... Mm-hmm. Because uh, a lot of the ladies go, no, that's you. You think that's non-essential. I think it's essential. Mm-hmm. The, in fact, it's kind of a funny deal. They even talk about the executive uh, orders. You can get your dog groomed. Yeah. Yes, that's essential. You can get your dog's haircut, and that's okay. While you're all sitting in the waiting room, coveting it up. Yep. Um, but if you have people going there to get their own haircut, oh, I'm sorry, that is just beyond the pale. We have to put you in jail <laughs> if you do that. Yep. And then the other one that's, that's funny on the, in the Shelley Luther case, uh, her salon is right next to a knickknack store. Now, the rules in Dallas were that they were not putting people in jail for stealing less than, than uh, unless you stole at least $750. Yes. Uh, you didn't go to jail. So Shelley could have gone next door and shoplifted $700 worth of stuff 
And Dallas says, ah, so busy, can't reach. You got to do what you got to do. But if she goes in and she opens her salon and serves one dollar of person, it serves people. You she go to jail. jail. Yeah. And so then you get to the funny part where the, the governor says, the GA-22, oh, I didn't mean to put people in jail. I didn't know you were going to put people in jail for this. So I'm going to retroactively make it legal for salons to be open as of April 2nd. Yeah. And I, that's when I go to the trial court and say, okay, trial court, if you think that the governor can make laws ex cathedra, create crimes, make and suspend laws however he wants, can he also, does that limit it in any way? Can he now retroactively make her actions legal? Therefore, there shouldn't be any TRO. Therefore, mm-hmm. there shouldn't be any order for contempt. Got me. Well, that, 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 that's what's <laughs> been the whole problem with all of this since the beginning, right? I mean, so the governor uh, purports to make law under Section 418 of the government code, right? He comes out with a, an executive order at the beginning of April, which does not articulate a stay-at-home order. But then he goes uh, to the media and says, yes, this is a stay-at-home order. You're not supposed to leave the house until, unless you're, you're, you're uh, patronizing an essential business. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's completely different than your order says. So everybody listens to him instead of does the order. Everybody's confused. Nobody knows what the deal is. Same thing with Shelley Luther, as you just described. And uh, same thing with the mask order, mm-hmm. right? So we have a mask order that says that the police may not... Uh, may not detain a person for purposes of enforcing this order. Well, how are you going to write them a ticket if you can't detain them? Right. (laughs) So so we've got, I've got a gal contacted me last week trying to get into Tarrant County courthouse Mm -hmm. during the commissioner's court. She's wearing a mask, but her child who's two is not wearing a mask. She gets a criminal trespass notice. Okay. What part of shall not detain yeah. are you talking about? You're, and, and okay, so the governor's order says you can be less than 10. If you're less than 10 years old, you don't have to wear the mask. And he also says nobody can make rules that are more strict, that do not comport basically with my rule. And then so some sheriff's deputy yeah. is, you know, is decided, you know, Judge Dredd, I am the law. They don't you know? Know. And, yeah. and so they're just enforcing whatever they want. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, and, and, the, and then that. you get with the original orders where, where he prohibited localities from finding people for mask use. And then all of a sudden the, the cities like his office didn't tell the county judges this, uh, the, the counties, um, say, okay, we're going to find businesses. And he says, okay, you unlocked my code. It was like <laughs> the cheat code in a, mm-hmm. in a video game or something. Okay. That was my secret. You found it out. Congratulations. You move on to the next level. I mean, what <laughs> you're embedding codes in your orders. No, I, it, it, his, his behavior during all of this has just been one of of inconsistency, uh, unsuredness, uh, fear. I mean, you see it. He's he's very unsure of what to do. It, mm. it just we've seen no leadership. Contrast that with Ron DeSantis. Okay, right. Ron DeSantis. I might have an issue with him shutting down the state of Florida uh, to begin with, but he opened it up pretty quick, and his messaging has been focused on the data, focused on assuaging fears. Mm-hmm. Uh, Abbott has been the exact opposite. He's been stoking irrational fear, mm-hmm. like like sharing the story of a guy who denied that COVID was an issue and then caught COVID and almost died, or, or, or did die, I, I think he was doing. Okay, we don't need to make people more afraid. I think the polls show the average American believes 9% of the country has died of COVID so far, <laughs> 33 million yep. people. The problem isn't people are, aren't afraid enough. The problem is people are too afraid. Mm. Um, and we just haven't seen leadership out of the governor on that. Well, I think that, that there's the whole problem is that he's not really adopting what we would consider Republican values. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's trusting in his own smartness. He's anointed so he can make these rules Mm -hmm. and balance all the legislative, uh, things that we want to balance, uh, without anybody having an impact. So I'm not sure why, why he would do that. You know, if you really believe this stuff. If you really believe, first of all, if you, if you come out and say, look, COVID is transferred by surface germs, mostly. Mm-hmm. So I want everybody to put in your brain this subroutine of don't touch other people's stuff. But instead of doing that, he says, here's a set of rules. Like I kind of look at it like as an Old Testament versus a New Testament approach. Uh, here's a set of rules. But the, really the right way to do it is to say, no, here's a principle. Don't touch other people's stuff. And so when you go to put gas in your car, there is no set of rules that say don't touch the gas pump. But if you say don't touch things other people have touched, then you then then people go, okay, 
I, I, I'm not going to touch the restaurant door unless I have to. I'm, I'm going to wipe the gas pump before I use it again because I don't know who's been using that. If you instill a, a principle of not touching other stuff and let people use their brain, then maybe maybe the 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 uh, the saloons the uh, the the bars develop a path that's forward that's that's better than what the bureaucrats will come up with, but you have to allow that. And if you don't allow that, then nobody's nobody's everybody's happy to look at a set of rules and say I'm not, I'm not just being a rule. Yeah, but you're you're not really paying attention to what you're touching. Uh, that's the problem. It's uh, no there there are many problems. Again, another reason that government should be smaller than it is today. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that Republicans should not be giving everyone a roadmap of what a tyrannical unilateral government looks like. Um, and so it's an unfortunate reality, but I've really appreciated both of you coming on and talking about these different legal um, actions against the governor, proposals of the governor, and then what some of his actions have led to uh, in the Lone Star State. Hopefully in the coming months, we will see somebody wake up and start to govern our state differently um, leading into you know the rest of the year. But I, I'm highly doubtful of that since we are in an election year and seem to have a governor who's pretty driven by the polls. And once you've instilled fear into all the voters, you then can't take bold action because you've made them all afraid. And you now have an election in which you don't want to take any action that would offend them prior to them voting. And so that is the unfortunate reality that our uh, governor has put us in. But I'm really grateful for both of you giving me your time. Uh, Hopefully other people will have learned a little bit about what the governor's doing and uh, the legal actions being taken against him. So thank you, Warren. Thank you, Matt, for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.